Io chiamerei a questo punto John per il keynote. Un bel applauso a John Bidiscom. Ascoltami, troppo basso, più alto, così. Normalmente parlo abbastanza forte. Is this okay? Can you hear me all right? E mi scusi per tutti perché quando parlo in inglese tutti dice, dicono che parlo troppo veloce. E quindi se, se avete problemi a capirmi, dice qualcosa. Perché quando parlo in inglese I tend to get a little bit excited and carried away. And, And I talk a little bit quickly, and so if it's hard to follow me, just interrupt me and ask questions, please. We have 90 minutes, so there's, there's a lot of time. It's not a problem. And uh, that looks good, doesn't it? So whilst they set this up, I'll just introduce some... Um, Oh yeah, good idea. So I'm from CSCS, the Centro, Calculo di, uh, Centro Svizzero di Calcolo Scientifico, which is the Swiss National Supercomputing Center. And we act as a, a coordinating center for all the universities in Switzerland. And we actually have people from all over the world who use our computers as well. And really it's because building big computers and maintaining them is quite expensive and time consuming. So it's, you know, Switzerland's quite a small country. So having one computer center with all the universities connected to it, it, ma it makes sense. And um, so our job effectively is to help the scientists at all the universities in Switzerland to use our computers. Because I'm sure you know that you, you write a piece of code and it works fine on your machine. But then when you want to run it on a really big computer, you have to make changes. And so our expertise really is in making the kind of changes that the, the scientists need to make. So they're the experts in the science. We're the experts in the, let's say, the computer science. Or my, my job title is computational scientist, which means someone who helps the scientists get, the, get their, their, their codes running on the computers. And um, the, uh, this, is this going to take, take a while? Because 90 minutes without slides is going to be fun. So <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't, can't remember where to start. Um, yeah, so we help the scientists get their stuff going. And the, the, the things we do fall into a whole bunch of categories, which is on the first slide. So I'll wait for that to come up. And, uh, If, if you want me to get my laptop ready, I can uh, set mine up. We don't look at slides and we go offline. Ah, okay. Oh, it's, it's an internet problem, okay. <coughs> um, actually, to help me, I, ha I have a lot of slides to show. And so 90 minutes is a long time, and I have about 90 slides, which is quite a fair pace. Are people here generally familiar with multi-threading and the sort of things that... I mean, HPX is all about threading and task-based programming. And I'm, I'm kind of assuming that many of, you, many of you will have seen presentations on this before. So in a way, I can skip through some of the introductory material. Um, just uh, are many, uh, how many of you know nothing about like HPX and multi-threading, that kind of stuff? Only a couple of hands. So most, most of you are reasonably comfortable and familiar with this kind of thing. Okay, so when we get to the slides about the background, I'll, I'll, I'll go fairly quickly then. and Because uh, the more interesting stuff, I guess, is in the second half of the talk rather than the first half. Don't you just click view and it goes and okay. Okay, okay so grazie. Uh, let me just practice with this forwards and backwards. Okay. And is that a pointer? No. Okay. So 
I'm John. I'm, I'm using material from other members of our group. Mikhail, Rafael, Shoshana, and Yost are all members of the group at CSCS. The, um, Hartmut is the, let's say, the founder of the HPX project. He's at Louisiana. Thomas is in Germany. Augustine is Argentina. And there's material from contributors all over the world to HPX. Um, Oh, it does work. Okay, great. And I work for the scientific software and libraries, which I've just explained. We, we help develop libraries and software for the scientists. And let me just check this goes. Ah, okay, great. So the things I'm going to talk about today, but not in any particular order, this is just a, a bullet point of list, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go from one topic to another fairly randomly, is um, task-based programming. That's basically what HPX is all about, is writing your code in terms of tasks. And... Um, in order to do that, we have futures as our main synchronization mechanism, executors, schedulers, and, and we use thread pools for doing, you know, putting, putting work into pools. Um, we're trying very hard to keep to standards so that the code that we write today is portable tomorrow. Um, the parallel algorithms, we've implemented them all. There were a few things that we'll mention about how you, how you use those. Um, and then some stuff on the future of, of HPX, where we're going, where the standards are going, that kind of thing. And I, I'm not going to have a particular topic on that. I'll just throw comments in throughout the rest of the material. And then a little bit of material on distributed HPX if we have time at the end. And I'll try and wrap the second half of the talk up in one of the applications that we're actually using HPX on to give you an example of how we really use it. Because it's, it's I mean, you see the slides, you see the, the concepts, you look at it and you think, that's great, but how do I actually write something big that uses this? So hopefully I'll try and explain how we do that. Um, and everybody tells me that I talk and I don't actually explain what it is I want to say. <laughs> so, so there's three things I want you to come away with today, which is that HPX is trying very hard to absorb all the standards. And if the standards change, great. Well, we'll have to change with them. But if we can keep our code fitting to where the standard is going, then we know that it'll work tomorrow in the next year and that kind of thing. And we want to give programmers, you guys, the power to do what you want to do as simply as possible, but still give you all the knobs and things that you can twiddle and tweak so you can really go down to the bare metal if you have to. And Task-based programming, the idea is to give you multi-threaded code without having to write threaded code, if you possibly can, to try and keep it simple and nice. And as I say, the syntax might change. I'll go through that in a moment. But, but the actual implement, you know, the how you, AMT is asynchronous many tasks. The, the basic ideas that I'm talking about today hopefully won't change, even if the syntax does change slightly. Um, so I mentioned whilst we were waiting CSCS, this is our big computer, and we have 5,000 pure main, or 5,000 nodes with GPUs in, and another 1,000 which are just multi-core nodes. And those are the ones which I, I actually do my, oops, I beg your pardon. I do most of my work on these multi-core nodes, uh, these, these ones here. We have 1,800. We're number five in the world, so it's a pretty big machine, and we have people from all over the world using it. I mean, people log in from everywhere and use the machine. Um, and I, I mentioned what we do. I should look at this screen here rather than looking back up there. Um, so what we do is we, we help the scientists work. They have their code. It works fine on their laptop, or it works fine on their development machine. And then they want to run it on that big machine with 5,000 nodes. There are changes they need to make. Sometimes the algorithms that they've used don't scale very well. So we say, oh, you should probably use a different algorithm. So we help them with that. We help them with the hardware, because we're, we're trying to keep at the forefront of technology. So we have new nodes when they come out, new, new types of CPU, new GPUs. So we're supposed to be experts in how to, how to maximize that kind of performance. Um, languages, things like keeping up with the standards in C++ and saying, ah, but you could use this feature, it'll help you with that. Um, and also um, things like task-based programming, saying, well, if you were to rewrite the code in this way, maybe you could get better performance. And so we're exploring things like task-based programming to find out, can we actually get some of those codes which they scale up to 1,000 nodes and then they flatten off and by the time you get to two, three, four thousand, they're just not going anywhere. Can we do better with things like task-based programming? And that's really the subject of this talk. So task-based programming is basically breaking your code up into blocks. I mean, all of your programs are already task-based because you have functions, you call them, you do things. But task-based goes a little bit further because you try to build graphs out of it in a more, let's say, in a more rigorous way than in the way where you just write code and call functions and call functions. And this would be a traditional fork join where you say, I've got a thread running, and then I'll do a parallel for loop, and then I'll do something else, and then I'll do another parallel for loop, and you break your code up into little blocks. And um, where we really try and go a bit further is to, to allow you to write code that looks more like that, to be completely asynchronous, 
but to somehow connect all these tasks together so that you, so that you can maximize the throughput and minimize the waiting effectively. And at some point in there, you're going to need to prioritize. So you're going to need to say that this one here has got several hanging off it. This one here has got several hanging off it. So this one should probably be executed as quickly as possible, as soon as, soon as you can, so that these ones don't end up waiting. And the problem really with this fork join approach is that at this point here, you've got, say, three cores doing work. Here, you've only got one. And sometimes there's stuff over here that you could be doing on these cores. So really, the difference between those two graphs is just shifting things in so that you can, you can bring in work from other places. And, um, and we want to make it as easy as possible for you so that you don't have to really, you don't have to really work at writing thread-based code. You want to just create tasks, create tasks, and have some way in your, in your language to, to simply connect them together. And let, let, the, let the, I'm going to use the word runtime, you let the runtime do the work of coordinating all those tasks for you. And I'll come to what we mean by runtime in a minute. So one of the things you get kind of for free out of a task-based programming is a more functional approach. If you confine your tasks to taking inputs and outputs, so that everything that goes into a task is encapsulated in the task, and you try to avoid this global, global state, global arrays, global things, you don't have to worry nearly so much about races and locks and all these kind of things which mess up your simple code. So the continuation parsing style is what we use in HPX, where you have continuations attached. And the continuations are effectively these, these arrows represent continuations from one task to another. And, and, our, and it's the, really the subject of this, this talk is how we, how we actually get that all working. So avoid global data, avoid locks, avoid races, if you possibly can. I mean, you can never get rid of all your global stuff. There's always going to be things in there. And we, so we still provide all those low-level things. But the idea is to try and encourage a data flow style of programming where things connect to each other. Um, and just as a little example, when you, when you do data flow programming, you want your tasks to be a good size. Because if, OK, fork join, you have to wait. If there's no fork join, but you're lucky, then you can do this. If the tasks are too big, you end up with blocks where processes are doing nothing. And so if you can get all your tasks down to manageable sizes, then data flow and task-based programming works really quite nicely. So, why is CSCS interested in HPX? I mean, there's, there's actually quite a lot of task-based frameworks out there, and we could choose any one of them. Uh, the, real, the real reason is that we know that task-based programming, is, is, it's here. It's a thing. People are doing it. And we're doing it. Um, and so we're going to have to take some of those big scientific codes that we have at CSCS. Um, and some of these codes are big. They're millions of lines, and they've been going for 10, 15, 20 years. We have the problem that lots of code is written in Fortran, lots of it's written in old C, and there's not much that we can do about that. Other, I mean, I'm working on C++, and I'm working on HPX. Other people are working on some of the fortran -y things and those kind of stuff. So fortunately, it's not directly my problem to solve that right now, although if we can write code which one day the Fortran people can connect to and use, I'll come to that as well. So, we want the scientists to rewrite their codes, but we don't want them to rewrite them this year. And then next year, say, oh, we got a new library. It's even better, and it does things differently, and it's great. So now rewrite it again, and then keep doing that with big code, because it's just not. It's just not, it's not cost effective. It's not scalable. It's not portable. You know, it's, it's not useful. So the idea is, if the people are going to rewrite their code, then do it once. Keep to the standard wherever possible, because you know that the code that you write to the standard this year will still work in five years, or 10 years, or even longer. And so we're really, <laughs> OK, in, at least in principle. Some things will be deprecated. But the idea, OK, so this is an optimization problem. I want to minimize the number of code rewrites that people are doing. And, um, and we don't really want to rely on vendor-specific vendor um, features. Uh, we want to keep it architecture independent, platform independent, keep it to the core language as best as possible. And, and so why not, for example, use something like OpenMP or one of the other runtimes that's out there? And really, OpenMP is great. I mean, it does a great job. If you've got existing code and you stick a Pragma OpenMP parallel in front of a loop, it just works. And that's great. And if that's good enough, then just go ahead and use it. But 
there are things which you can't really do very easily with OpenMP, where you've got a much more dynamic task graph. OpenMP is great for the fork join and the fairly static, and they've introduced tasks into OpenMP, so you can spawn off bits of work. But what we want to do in HPX is really, you have a function which returns a future, a, you know, a, an object, which it could be anything, and you can pass that as a parameter to another function, and it can do something to it, and it can return another future to another, another object, and you can pass futures around like parameters, and you can actually build your graphs completely dynamically, and you really don't have to know anything at compile time other than the types of the things you're passing around. This is something which is just not easy with something like OpenMP. So, so so that's why HPX really exists. And things like nested parallelism are much harder in OpenMP than in HPX, or even not supported in some cases. And as the language adds features, so in C++ we have parallel, parallel STL algorithms. When they all become standard and they become efficient and they work really well, nobody's going to use the OpenMP. And that means the people who are des developing OpenMP and maintaining it, they're probably going to say, well, nobody's using it. We don't need to spend so much time on it. So the support will gradually drop. And in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, those codes, which if we tell scientists to rewrite all their code using OpenMP, this, that, and the other, in 20 years' time, they may have to rewrite it again. And, and it's all about this maintenance issue. So keeping to the standard, and wherever we can, improving the standard and pushing it forward as well. Um, I should mention, uh, there, are, there are other runtimes out there which use what they call a memoization approach to, um, to, to task-based programming, where you, you may describe your algorithm in terms of some abstract, like a, like a DSL. You can describe your algorithm in terms of blocks, which you then run through a preprocessor, and it generates a nice optimal implementation of that. And that's great if you have very specific algorithms which are never going to change. But it's really tedious for people to use. And if you can do the same thing, but using the core language, which we're trying to do in HPX, then even better. If, so if we can avoid all these kind of symbolic intermediate representations of task graphs and just generate them on the fly from your code, that's what we're aiming for in terms of our, uh, our long-term goal. So to summarize what I've kind of said there is we want a unified, consistent API for task-based programming, and I'm going to say a futurized API, because we use the future as our basic primitive to synchronize everything in HPX. And we want to solve the problem of concurrency and parallelism. And in my mind, I think of concurrency when several tasks are working at the same time, but they're doing something different. Whereas parallelism, several tasks are working on the same problem. So a parallel for loop or a parallel sort, a parallel find, that's parallelism. Whereas concurrency is where your graph is just doing things, and it's all happening at the same time. Wherever we can, and I'm not really going to have time, I don't think, today, to go into CPUs and GPUs, but if we can possibly integrate spawning work on a GPU, getting a future back, which we, we do, and then integrating that into your graph, that's all there. So we support that. It's, it's not as well developed as the core CPU stuff, so I, I'm not going to make that the focus of today. Distributed computing, we're also doing futures which you can spawn on a different node get a result back from that, and do everything in, you know, using the same API. That's also working. And I've got a couple of slides on that. But again, it's not the main focus of today. And if in n years' time we can replace OpenMP, OpenAC, and MPI with just nice, pure C++ basic language, that would be just lovely. And uh, <coughs> so everybody knows what a future is, yes? You do something. You need a result which is running on a different thread. You maybe pause and suspend whilst you're waiting for that work which is running on another thread. The other thread delivers it back to you, and then you get, and the future is this shared object, which is a synchronization primitive between two threads, ideally. So work is going on. You can get it from somewhere. The thing that's really different about the way HPX works is what happens in here and, um, and how we use futures to build DAGs. Um, The, the difference in, in HPX is that we're using lightweight threads. And I've already mentioned all of these things, but we want to implement all of the things that I've talked about, all of the DAG building, all of the task synchronization, in terms of lightweight threads. And lightweight threads are essentially, I think it's, people would call them fibers in other languages. Um, the operating system maintains threads. 
And the operating system is responsible for giving time slices to threads, so that when you create a thread, the operating system has a, it's a, it's a forward progress guarantee that at some point that, that thread will be given a time slice, it'll do some work, it'll move on. In HPX, we create threads, but we don't, but we don't necessarily have the same forward progress guarantee that the operating system would give you. And because threads are expensive to create, the operating system has to manage them, it has to keep them in going, it has to schedule between them. We don't want to create loads and loads. If you were to do some of the DAGs that we're, that we're building using OS threads as your basic primitive, the costs of that switching in and out and waiting for your time slice to kick in would actually make your code run a lot more slowly. And some of the STL algorithms that we've implemented in HPX, I, I, I don't remember the exact figures, but we, somebody produced a paper where they benchmarked. And so we have a whole bunch of the parallel STL, pick a bunch of them at random, run some tests on them using just the, the HPX threads, and do it the same again using standard threads. And it was something like three to one difference on some of the smaller pieces of work. And that's quite significant at the, at the low end. If you're doing huge, great chunks of work, usually the overheads are lost. And we'll talk about that as well. So HPX creates at startup, effectively, you've got eight cores on your node, it creates eight threads. And I think the next slide has the, um, I'll come back to that slide in a minute. So you have a bunch of cores, and what we do is we create one thread per core and we bind it. And then on each one of those threads, we run our own little scheduler and a queue of work. And then you create tasks using async, and these other things mentioned here. And the work goes into queues, and then the scheduler takes the work off the queue, executes it, and returns back to the queue again, effectively. Now, when you, uh, wrong, 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 oh, sorry, wrong direction. I'm trying to go back, back, back. The, the difference in HPX here is that when you, when you want something from another thread, but it isn't ready yet, and you say get from the future, what HPX does is it says, okay, I can't have that because it's not ready yet, so I have to suspend myself. So effectively what the runtime does is it just, it takes, it puts itself back on the queue. So the task that you're operating at the moment, which is being executed by the scheduler, gets to a point where it says, I need something, it's not there. So it says, oh, I can't do anything. So it goes back into the scheduler queue with a little flag saying, execute me when this is ready. And it just pulls the next piece of work directly off the queue. And then it gets on with that. And the queue, we hope, is full of work that can be done because the things that it needs are already ready. And so this is, it's, it's basically very simple except that it's actually quite complicated in the internals. And the real difference is that means that you ideally never have to wait for anything because there's always, or you do have to wait, but as whilst you're waiting, something else is being done. And this is really the main difference between the, using the OS level threads and using the HPX threads is because the scheduling is being done by the runtime here rather than by the operating system. And it allows us to do things like nested parallelism because when you have a parallel for loop and inside that parallel for loop, each element is creating a parallel for loop and each one of those is creating a parallel for loop, you just create tasks and they go on the queues and they go on the queues and they go on the queues and you just let the scheduler find out when things are ready. And, um, and um, so I mentioned that um, we bind the cores, we bind, the que we bind our threads to the cores when, when HPX starts up, and we have different binding methods, and you can see that you, know, you can either do them compact or scattered, and so that allows you to sort of specify which, which, which cores you want your things to run on. I'll mention that again when we come to things like thread pools. Um, so I mentioned the advantage of the lightweight thread. The, li the advantage is that we can switch between different tasks much more quickly than if we leave it to the operating system. And the, a context switch in HPX takes, you know, it's over the order of microseconds. You basically have to swap out the stack pointer, swap out the registers, and move to a different thing. And it's really the stack which is the main, the main, um, the main overhead. And uh, that's something we're working on improving all the time. Um, HPX doesn't interrupt your task. So there's a subtle difference here. There are some codes that you can write using standard threads where you can say, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you can create more threads than there are cores. And because the operating system guarantees each one a time slice, the code will actually run and complete. And if you did exactly the same on HPX, sometimes you can get deadlocks because if you, 
Because HPX doesn't interrupt your task, if you're, if you're spinning, for example, you don't actually suspend, but you spin on something, and you do that in every thread, all of those threads will just spin forever. And the other thread which might be producing what you're spinning for isn't ever pulled in because HPX doesn't stop your tasks at any point. It only stops your task if you yield. And that happens when you call get on a future or one of those things. So there's a subtle difference, and it's something you need to be aware of. It's not something which ever causes a problem in reality because of the way we build our DAGs. So we'll come to that. Um, so the runtime is very similar to OpenMP and thread building blocks and lots of other ones out there, except that in OpenMP, you have parallel regions. You tend to have a main thread which is running, and then you get to a parallel region, and you do some work on threads, and then you come to the end of the parallel region, and then you resume normal operation. In HPX, the whole code is a parallel region. Int main runs on a task, effectively. You start up the code, and the thread pools are running before you do anything, and your int main can run on an HPX task. And so the whole code is a parallel region. So you just don't have to think in terms of fork join and parallel regions in the same way. Now, that means that we can do awesome stuff quite easily. It does mean our overheads are a bit higher. And I'll come to that later as well. So we're always in a parallel region. Now, of course, you can stop the runtime and restart it and do a fork join type approach. More on that. Um, so. What we have is a threading system and LCOs, local control objects. Local control objects are mutexes and semaphores and um, all the other ones, you know, things like threads. Um, I'm trying to think what the other, it's gone out of my mind now, but you know, you know the ones. Um, futures, mutexes, semaphores, all the synchronization objects that you normally get in the standard library and that you're familiar with. Um, and on top of that, we have the C++ API for parallelism, so the whole STL is implemented on top of this subsystem. And then we have two or three extra little things in here, which I'm not going to go into at a huge length today, but we have a performance counter framework. So whenever threads are active and they're doing work on your code, at the start of each one of those tasks, the performance counters can basically say, time I start the task, time I stop the task, and they count all that time up. And so they know how much time is wasted, spinning, waiting for work. And so you can have idle time in, in the schedulers. And that's all collected by counters. And we have counters for there's hundreds of them. You can count, you can basically, and you can create counters yourself. If you've got an algorithm and you think, oh, I'd really like to know how much this is, you can create a counter and you can add it into the main thing and then you can have HPX dump out the contents of that. And the nice thing about that is, in principle, you can use those counters to then steer the runtime to, if you had, if you had for example, things like um, adaptive algorithms that you wanted to, shift more here and less here and that kind of thing. You can actually use it. And, and there's a prototype where they power down. So when the idle time goes up to a certain level, they power down some cores. They put them into a lower frequency mode so that they save power on the machines. So that's a kind of experimental feature. But this is the performance counter framework is actually very, very cool and very nice, but I'm not going to really talk about it today. The LCOs, we will talk about briefly. Active global address space, this is used for the distributed HPX. AGAS, I think I, I think I mentioned it in another. AGAS and the parcel layer are for sending packets to other nodes. So if you say, I want to execute this task, but I want it on that node over there, and give me a future back when it's done, AGAS and the parcel layer do that for you. And um, AGAS is effectively a, um, it's a distributed key value store in memory for handling basically IDs of things on different nodes. So I mentioned the LCOs, the local control objects. So because we do things on lightweight threads and not on OS threads, you can't just stick in a standard this thread sleep. If you put a sleep, if you put a sleep into your thread here, then what you're doing is you're not suspending the HPX task. You're suspending the actual OS thread that it's running on. And that means that that whole sort of that whole work stealing dynamic nested parallelism thing is basically frozen. So we have to re-implement standard thread with HPX thread. Mutexes and semaphores and those things which, which you use don't use standard mutexes and standard threads or standard futures. Use HPX mutexes and futures because what they do is they, they interact with the runtime and they tell the thread to effectively suspend and pull more work off and not do the underlying OS thread, which is what would happen otherwise. And um, so async is re-implemented. And these ones are implemented because our threading system is different. And these ones are implemented because if we support spawning work on other nodes, 
we have to be able to serialize functions and serialize arguments. And so things like when you bind, a f when you bind arguments to a function and then you say execute that function on a different node, we have to be able to somehow serialize that and tell the other node. We have to have a unique identifier and, and a, you know, a type ID effectively that the other node, when it unpacks that, unpacks that packet, it can effectively say, ah, he wants this function and is these arguments are bound to it. So, so there's a little bit of extra work in the binding, the functions, the tuples, the ennies, those kind of things, so that we can serialize things across nodes. And that's actually a huge amount of work in its own right, but fortunately someone else did all that, so that's nice. Well, things like standard C out, it can actually block. So if it's blocking your underlying thread, that's not good. So we've re-implemented that with an HPX C out, which has you know, a more friendly, um, I mean, it actually uses C out under the hood, but it does it on a special dedicated thread, which is outside of our normal runtime. And, and you can do that kind of thing. And so we have all of the, um, the STL. So that's kind of what HPX is. And I'll just check the time. How long have I, how long have I talked for? Is this half an hour already? OK, so I better speed up a bit. So the basics, I'll go through these pretty, pretty quick. Um, so the, you know what a future is. You want to do something on a different thread. You say, asynchronously execute this, give me the answer at some point in the future, and when you call get, the answer will either come back immediately if it's already been done, or the thread will wait, do some other work, and at some point, it'll trigger this and it'll resume. And you kind of don't need to know. You don't really need to know when it comes ready, because when you, when I, when I come to continuations, when you, when you attach a continuation to a future, that continuation is stored in a special, a special shared state inside the future, so that when that future comes ready, it just immediately knows all the tasks which are waiting for it, and it can trigger those, and it's done quite neat, neat and cleanly. So, so in fact, we never, the idea is never use get, because get is a waiting call, and we want to eliminate all waiting. So we support this, but we don't actually use it. So creating futures, you can use async, which I just showed you, package task and promises, which I'm going to assume you guys know about. So you know what a package task is. It's a way of generating a future by giving a task object to a thread. A promise is a bit more, oh, sorry, this is um, the wrong slide. Um, a package task, if a package task basically is an object you can create, you give it a function, you can get a future out of it, you can then give that function to a different thread, detach that thread so it goes off somewhere, and then just return a future, and that future will become ready when that task finishes and completes and sets that ready. You can, uh, you can use a promise. We have promises in HPX. I have to say, I never use package tasks. I, d I, don't, I don't remember when I've ever actually needed one. Promises you will use from time to time because the, you know, they're, they're convenient ways of effectively creating an object, getting a future from it, then giving that object to someone else and saying, go off and do things, and when you set the value, I'll have it. Um, the promise owns the shared state. The shared state is that thing, that synchronization object, which connects the thread doing the work to the thread that wants the answer. And the promise is really the, 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 the core object behind the future and behind most of the sort of internals of HPX. Um, we have a, um, you, you see how you can uh, create a promise, get a future from it, and then let the thing go off. I'm skipping through these quickly. You can actually, do a little, the, the way we support remote futures is because inside our local control objects, this LCO thingy, we have a way where you can, you can take an ID from the promise. And this is where this AGAS fits in, this global address. If, if, you, if you execute a task on a remote node, what you're effectively doing is you're giving a function to a remote node, and you're also giving it a promise. And when you give it the promise, you keep the identifier to the promise ID, which is stored in AGAS. And then the remote node can effectively then say, set the value on this promise with this ID. AGAS will look up that, and it will find the node that owns it, and it will set it on that node. And this is how the remote futures are done. So this is a little side point. But this is how we support remote execution of tasks um, by using this kind of thing. Um, you can create a package task out of a promise. You just wrap up a function. You have a return type and arguments, and then you create a function object. And then the call operator calls the function, sets the value into the promise, and get future just returns the future directly from the promise. So that's how you would create a package task out of a, out of a promise. Um, making a ready future. 
you might wonder, why would you ever want to create a ready future? You, you want a future, and it's already ready. Well, it's actually surprising how often you need those, because there's algorithms where you, for example, iterate until some condition is met. And when that condition is met, instead of calling the function and returning that, the future from that, you just say, set it with 0 or 1, like a Fibonacci kind of thing. There's, um, I, I, I'm always reminded of the film Memento. Memento, everything is done backwards. It's the most fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it. But what you do when you're working with HPX is you say, ah, I've got this piece of code. And what I do is I calculate this, and then I calculate that. But actually, those two things are kind of independent. I'm doing those seriously. What I could do is I could spawn a task to calculate this, and I could spawn a task to calculate that. And now I've got two futures. And then I can just get the result of that and return it. And then you think, hold on a minute. I don't actually need to get the result of those two and return the result. I could just get the futures and then return a future to the result that I'm currently calculating. So now my function, instead of returning a value, returns a future of a value. And then your function that calls that, you think, hold on a minute. I'm calling that function. I'm getting a value. But actually, I could just call all these other and return a future. And you, you end up with this. You start at the leaf nodes of your code, returning futures. And then it's like when you add const. You put the word const in one piece of code, and it sort of filters through your entire code base. And you think, oh my god. Well, the futures, the futures are like that. You, you suddenly think to yourself, I, I don't actually need to calculate anything. I can just create a future for it and just let the runtime do it. It's revolution. It, it's like when somebody first shows you to how to do object-oriented programming, and you think, oh my god, you know, I can have a, I can have a, I can have a, a geometric object, and I can have circles and spheres and, and squares, and they all are types of this, and, and it changes the way you write code. And it's the same with that for me. The futures, futures change the way you structure your code, because you don't really care quite so much now about how you order things necessarily. In, in you, just, you just kind of create tasks and then throw them all into the system. And, and a little side point is that if you change your function so that instead of returning a t, it returns a future of a t, and then you have to change the function which calls that, because now the return type is actually different. It's not a, fu it's not a t anymore. If you, if you asynchronously call a function which returns a future, you get a future of a future. Well, that, that gets decayed automatically in, in the code by the compiler, effectively. There's, the metaprogramming handles that. So the future of a future just decays to a, just one future. So you don't end up with like future of future of future of future and go, get, 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 get. And uh, you know, you'd, you'd go mad if you did. Um, so the big deal in HPX is that we extend futures. You want to compose these futures. You want to have futures and connect them all together and build DAGs out of them. So you, you want to build all the algorithms and, and do those kind of things. And we want parallel and sequential composition. And I'll explain that now. And another thing called data flow. So I'll go into that here, which is dot then. Dot then is totally awesome, because you can say, when this future becomes ready, then do this. So you've created a connection between one task and another task. Dot then. Lovely. And the thing that's really awesome about dot then is that when this future becomes ready, f1 becomes ready, then it executes function 2, which returns something else. This continuation is only called when the first, compute, when the first future finishes. So there's actually never any waiting in there. This task runs, and when it finishes, it says, now this task can run. Nobody waited on anything. This task just sat in sort of task space somewhere. And when it was ready, it just got run. And the runtime pulls it in and says, you're ready to run. Because when this, when this first future finishes, F1 basically sets a flag in this task to say, it's now ready. And then the scheduler goes through its list and says, ah, oh, that one's ready. And it just runs it whenever it's free. It's wonderful. Now, the latest proposal has changed very slightly the way this goes on. because. We actually use future. So, so f1 returns a future to an int. And f2 takes an int. It actually takes a future of an int as the input. And then it returns a string. So this one here, this continuation, returns a future of a string. And it passes the future of an int into it. And it's a little bit kind of confusing when you see these syntaxes, especially when you have a long chain of dot thens. And you start to get confused as to which is which. But um, the point is that when f1 completes, you don't actually really need a future. Because if it's completed, the thread which is executing that task can set that next one ready. So this, this 105.4 proposal, which has gone in, so all of, I should, I should explain that 
HPX was based around Proposal 443, which was the main continuations and executives kind of proposal for C++, originally 17, now 20, maybe 23. I mean, in our lifetime, hopefully, all of this will go into the standard. We don't know when, but we keep our fingers crossed. So 0443 basically laid out the continuations and that kind of stuff. And, um, and of course, now 1054 changes to having future continuations because you don't need a full, you don't need a full future if you've got a continuation, because these, you don't need a, a thread synchronization in this bit, so there's no one need to have some of that expensive. So, so there's some changes which will come in, and they will make HPX slightly different. It won't change fundamentally the way we do anything, but it may change the syntax very slightly, so just bear that in mind. And, and, and of course, if something gets proposed for the standard and gets accepted, we'll modify HPX to do that. In, in our case, it would be quite a bit of work to go through all the code, so we will probably wait a bit and see if things change more. So you can do when all, and um, so you can have when this future and this future and this feature complete, then do that. So when all those futures are ready, then do this. And you can have shared futures, which allow you to do, I think the next, the next picture probably shows it better. So this is your basic introductory guide to how futures, how do you build DAGs out of futures? Well, it's great. You have a future and a continuation. You can have a shared future, which can trigger multiple continuations, so you can attach multiple dot thens to the same future. Now, that means that you have a shared state in here, which you have to be careful of, because dot then, uh, dot then passes the future through. A shared future can only pass the const ref to the, to, the, to the underlying thing inside the future through. So you have to be a little bit careful here, because you don't necessarily, one of these might want to modify it, and that, that kind of thing. I'll come to that in a little bit later. So when all lets you take the output of multiple futures. There's a when any. There's a when some. So you can say when some of these futures are ready, sometimes you just say, whichever one's first, just give it to me. I don't care about the rest. Throw them away. Like when you're doing something like, I don't know, some Monte Carlo type thing, whatever, you might just say, give me one, the first one that comes in. I want it. The rest, forget. We don't yet have a, a good way of actually canceling work, which is already, if something's in a queue, you can, in principle, you can delete it from the queue. If something's already started working, we can't necessarily cancel that, but that's a, a future improvement. So when each is interesting, because you might say, when each of these futures becomes ready, execute this task, but don't wait for them all to be ready, and then give me a future to the executed. Like, when that one, when that one finishes, do this, and when that one finishes, do this, and when that one finishes, do this, and they come in at different times. And when all of them are finished, then just give me the final result. So when each is a kind of like an asynchronous when all effect. You know, it's a, it's a rather clever little addition. I don't know if this one's in the standard, which is where I changed the color. I think we just made that up. I'm not sure. One of Hartnett's ideas, I think. Um, shared futures. A little side point is that in our algorithm, we use shared futures quite a lot. In our, I'll show you the stuff we're working on later. We use shared futures quite a bit. And you can create task B, task C, task D off those. You could actually just have a future. And when it comes ready, have task B. And then put a loop inside a continuation to generate task B, you know, B, C, D effectively. Uh, that, that shouldn't be a prime. I've copied and pasted wrong. There's no prime there. So you can either create multiple futures off a shared future. Or you could create multiple tasks. Sorry, multiple tasks or and you've got a bit of interplay, how you write the code. The difference, really, in this case, is where you need the futures to tasks B, C, and D to be. If you need them outside here, somewhere, to get these futures, you have to do it that way. If you can use these futures inside the, inside the continuation, then you do it that way. And the, I mean, the difference in terms of cost in, of the stuff you're creating is minimal, depending on you know, what you're actually doing. Um, so that's your kind of dictionary of how to create DAGs. Um, we have another optimization, which is actually it's similar to this idea that when futures complete and you trigger continuations, you don't need a whole thread mechanism. We have something in HPX called data flow. And data flow is like a, a collapsed form of when all dot then. So when all of these tasks complete, they complete a new future. And then you attach a continuation to that, which is a dot then do this. But actually, you're kind of wasting a future because you don't need that. Data flow effectively does what that other proposal is uh, talking about. And so you can say, when all of those do this. And one other difference with data flow is that it's, um, it delays the invocation of the continuation because you can actually pass futures into when all. So normally you pass arguments. Uh, but so if, if you have a function x, a function f, and you pass it a, b, c, then you execute f. But if you pass 
future of ACOM or B comma C into the function, then when all will effectively unwrap those futures and, and wait for those to be ready and then call the function. So when all is, when all is like a Swiss army knife in HPX of, of, of future things, and it's, it's, it's really, I use it everywhere. I hardly use the other stuff most of the time anymore. Data flow crops up everywhere. Um, so it saves one future because you don't have to create this extra one, and it's something we use a lot. Um, as a quick summary, this is a normal function. In C++ 11 and beyond, you've got asynchronous functions. You can bind things to functions. In HPX, we also have a fire and forget, which is called apply. So if you want to execute a task, but you don't actually want a future back from it, you just say, just do this somewhere. It might modify some global state. It might have some consequences, but you don't care. You can just do apply, and then you don't bother creating a future. It just goes into the queues, executes as a task, and it has no, no immediate side effect. You can bind things to apply. You can bind things, yeah, so we do all that. These actions are special ones which we use for, um, for doing remote invocation, so that when you want to wrap a function up in such a way that you can execute it on a remote node, you have to effectively decorate it with this HPX action, and that pulls in a whole load of template meta, you know, meta programming stuff, which does the serialization of the functions and the, the arguments and all the other stuff that goes with it. And um, so these ones I'm not really going to talk about today, but actions are for distributed. How are we doing time-wise? 10.30. Still got a bit of time. Okay, good. Um, only on 41, though. We've got to get to 90 by an hour and a half. So, so parallel algorithms, there's lots of them. And we, I think we've implemented all of them in HPX now. There might be one or two which are either buggy or not quite finished. And a couple of others that I've added, because I, I used to work in visualization. And when you're working on fragment sort of shader things, you're operating on lots of things. And then you want to, there's two, two useful functions which appear in the VTKM library, are reduced by key and sort by key. We've added those. So there's a whole bunch of parallel. They basically all work. And, and you should use them. They're, they're kind of marvelous. And, and I guess everybody will be using this stuff soon, because when, when people start getting all of the parallel algorithms like, as part of the standard in their library, you will use all this. And I won't go into how you, um, how you, uh, how you write clever things with them. I'm going to assume you know, the, you know most of the, the details. Parallel algorithms have execution policies, so that there are times when you want to do, there's times when you want to do a parallel sort sequentially which is, for example, when you're actually implementing parallel sort, you divide the list, and then you sort, and then you merge, and then you divide the, and you sort, and, and you have these hierarchical recursive steps. But at some point, there's a leaf node, and the leaf node, you want to do a sequential sort on it, but because you've implemented it using your own stuff, you, you might want to do it sequentially. So you have execution policies. There, there's other times where, for example, where you know, for example, you've created a thread pool, and it's only got one core in it, and you just happen to know that at compile time. So you could actually put in your parallel algorithms, use a sequential algorithm on that. Don't go through the overhead. There are times when you, I, I, I struggle to find the times when you're really going to want to do things sequentially when you're, you're working in parallel, but, but um, it exists. So you have sequential parallel, and the name of this one changed from data parallel to parallel unsequence, which is where you're allowed to vectorize so you can do SIMD kind of operations. And we do support the SIMD stuff in HPX. I can't pretend that I've actually used it properly, so I won't talk about it today. And you, we're using the VC library, which is part of a proposal for SIMD stuff, which hopefully that will all go in. And then eventually, all of the algorithms in HPX. And I think we also support the new ranges um, so we can do like a parallel sort, find those kind of things, and compose them into ranges. I haven't tested that myself, so again, I won't, I won't talk about it. Um, so you basically pass a policy in here saying, do this fill in parallel, off you go. Um, and we've extended those so that you can do, for example, a parallel for loop and return a future from it. So we have a parallel task policy and a sequential task policy and an unsequenced task policy, which is kind of interesting because that idea I gave you before about how you write the code and then you just return a future. Now you can put a parallel for loop in. You can say, well, do these million elements in blocks of 100,000 and just give me a future to the whole parallel for loop back. This is. It's just so awesome. <laughs> it's, it really changes the way you think about the code. Now, there are, there, there are issues concerned with some of that stuff, which I'll mention at the end of the talk. But um, So we've taken synchronous functions and returning them effectively as futures asynchronously. And um, it allows you to effectively merge this stuff into your bigger, your bigger picture, if you like. Um, so the for loops are very nice. There's for loops, for loop with a, with a reduction, for loops with induction, things so you can have 
you know, it's always a, it's, it really comes from the OpenMP syntax. You want to iterate with iterators, but you also want the index. So induction variables give you like the indexes, so you can get i and j, and you can test things inside loops. So you can you can you can you can do iterators of um, you can iterate for. Or, on a vector using your normal iterators, but you can still get the indexes out, and you can do strided ones. So for loop with n, for loop strided. Um, there's there's probably more which I haven't included on here, but you get the idea. Um, your toolbox of nifty things you can play with grows. Executors are the the interface between effectively the hardware and your vision of it. The executors let you say where you want stuff to run. You might have a GPU. I want to run this parallel for loop on the GPU. I, I've got a, I want to run it on the CPU. The executors are that placement operator which let you, let you execute work. And they're responsible for doing async, effectively. Async and then bulk async, because on a GPU you want to spawn 1,000 copies of this thread all doing the same thing. So you want to bulk execute. You don't want to have to call 4n equals. Um, Executors come in various flavors. In HPX, we've got a whole bunch of them. In fact, this list, I mean, it, to, to put the whole list up, I'd need pages and pages, and it would bore you to death, so I won't. Um, but the main ones you get, when, when you create parallel algorithms, you get sequential and parallel executors, kind of default ones for free. The main default executor is actually a pool executor, because at the start, we create a thread pool, and you execute on that. But you can create multiple thread pools and say, I'd like to execute this work on that pool and this work on that pool. I'll show you that in a little. Um, a distributed policy executor, if you wanted to create a vector and you wanted that vector to be distributed across these nodes, if you were using HPX in parallel, you would use a distribution policy executor. And you can also supply policies to say how much to put, you know, put this much and that much and this much on the different nodes, and off you go. Uh, CUDA executors, which these are kind of experimental CUDA. So we support GPU operation and getting futures, but it's, it's not as mature as the rest. Uh, and things like NUMA executors, which really are being replaced by thread pool executors. So you create thread pools on different NUMA nodes. You need parameters. I want a f I've got a for loop. My for loop is going to be a million elements, roughly. Should I run a million threads with one on each? Or should I run 100,000 with 10 on each? Or and in general, the bigger your chunk size, the less the overheads. Because what you're effectively doing when you create a for loop is you're saying, End, end threads and put this much work on each thread and off you go. And so sometimes you know in advance that the chunk size for this for loop should be around about this. Sometimes you want to let the runtime decide on its own. So then you would use an auto, uh, an auto chunk size. And then what it actually does is it runs a couple of iterations of the for loop, times it, and then does the rest that. There's overheads with that, so we don't use that much. Static chunk size, you would say, I want 100,000 in each thread, off you go. And dynamic chunk size, it's allowed to, um, to, 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 to change that slightly. And there's also a guided chunk size as well, which does something similar. Um, executor parameters allow you to customize the way the executor does its work effectively. Um, we're looking at things like affinity. You might want to add stuff for like prefetching of things in loops. Executor rebinding lets you say to an existing executor, to decorate it with additional parameters. This deviates very slightly from some of the, in, 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 the, in the, the standards at the moment, there are things like an executor requires and some feature. And we haven't, I don't think we've implemented that yet, but we have supported on and with, which lets you say, give me a parallel, executor, a parallel policy on this executor and with, and then parameter one, two, and three. And the problem here is that unless you know, oops, I beg your pardon, unless you, uh, I've lost my, Oops, I've lost my, my point. I'm going the wrong way, that way. Hold on. I pressed the wrong button and it seems to all go the wrong way. Um, there we go. So executors have different parameter types and you kind of need to know them beforehand. What, like an executor which runs on CUDA is gonna have different properties to it to an executor that runs on a thread pool. And you kind of need to know what they are before you get to part one and part two. And, and in my mind, this is still an unsolved problem of how we, how we allow the people writing the low-level hardware kind of executors and schedulers and things to talk back to the top level. I'm going to come back to that later. But we, we support this rebinding so that you can do these kind of things. And here's some more examples. Um, th this, I mentioned it here, having requirements effectively on an executor. This executor needs to support NUMA knowledge. 
how do you specify that up front? Because NUMA knowledge is something very specific to a certain architecture of machine, whereas things like CUDA do things differently. And you know, there are other, other accelerators out there which C++ will one day have to cater for, things like neural computing and things like that, and customize ASICs, which have interfaces which you're going to want to program with the same framework. So this is, this is all, we're doing it this way. Other solutions exist and, you know, if they work. I'll skip through some of this stuff because the, the time, is, um, time is ticking. Um, so to summarize the executors, where? The executor tells you where to execute a task. On this hardware, on this thread pool, on that GPU, on that other accelerator. How is the execution policies? So I want it done in parallel, I want it done serial, I want this kind of chunk size, I want that kind of thing. Um, and when is implicit in your DAG. I want this task to execute when that one's completed, subject to availability of resources in the machine. So you've really got the where, how, and when. And um, there are other things, for example, like um, we support priorities. I'll mention some of those in the real, in the, in the example in a minute. But priorities of tasks. Some tasks you need to finish first because they're important. So put them at the front of the queue. That's also an executive policy. Um, I just mentioned as well, there's a, there's, a, there's a suggestion, I don't know if it's been proposed as a full um, proposal, but different types of future. So when this future completes, then do this, and then do this, and then do this, they're all just futures. But supposing you had a CUDA future and a CPU future, or an MPI future, you could say when this task finishes running on the GPU, then execute another kernel. Now, the way we've implemented at the moment, when this task finishes on the GPU, you effectively get a stream event, which then triggers the future, which sets things back, which then triggers you to launch the next task. This is actually going from the CPU back to the GPU, and then it's going back to the GPU to execute the next kernel, and then at the end of that, it might come back to the CPU, and you've got this interplay. So one of the proposals is that effectively you take dot then out of the future, so instead of saying old future dot then, you say new future is equal to executor dot then, and then you pass the old future. This is interesting because what's happening now is this executor dot then, instead of the, co instead of the thread which is running the old future, so the old future triggers dot then. In this case, the executor triggers dot then. That means you could actually launch a thread on the GPU and have the GPU trigger the next operation because the executor is actually running on the GPU, not on the CPU. You could actually have the executor running somewhere else. So this is a subtle, a subtle difference in syntax, but it's potentially very interesting because it means that you can then bypass some of this going backwards and forwards. You can have executors which spawn code which is running on different hardware, triggering the futures on the different hardware and not necessarily coming back to the host. So this may change some of the syntax. I mean, the difference between saying old future dot then and executor dot then, I mean, it's a search and replace. It's not going to break anything too much. But it's, it's fundamentally an interesting change. And uh, so I mention it just, um, just in passing. We haven't implemented this yet, but there's something I'm looking at for the CUDA integration that we're looking into. Um, so time-wise, we're getting there. Real, real world use, so how do you turn all this stuff, all these DAGs, these tasks, how do you turn it into an actual bit of code that does something useful? So we have scientists running big codes and they're always doing solutions to big equations and whatnot, linear systems, that kind of stuff. And things like Cholesky are used frequently. And Cholesky is interesting because it has a very particular DAG. It has a sequence of operations that you can pre-compute if you want to. And, um, and people have done this. And we have matrices which are quite large. They're broken into tiles because then you have tiles which hopefully are around about the same as the cache size of the memory, you know, the processor you're working on. You execute operations on those tiles and to compute the whole decomposition, which looks effectively like that, what you're doing is you're effectively trying to find the nice triangular form of this matrix A, break it into L1 uh, left and right, and I'll talk you through it very quickly. You know that this operation here reduces L squared, so the solution here is just the root of L here. But that passes an L down to here, which you need to divide in here, which means multiplying by the inverse. So you compute the first diagonal, and you get a result. And then you have to multiply all the elements of that, or rather, you have to multiply the panel. But the panel is broken into tiles, so you have a series of tasks on each tile. and then that L 
2, effectively, 2, 1, is carried through to the next column over here. And you have to pass, so this one triggers these. These ones then trigger across. And so you have a DAG where you say, first do the diagonal, and then do all the ones in the panel down below. And as each one of these ones in the panel start going in columns, so you update the sub-panel there, or the, 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 the rank update on the, um, the lower, this remaining part. And that's one iteration, effectively. And then you do this one exactly the same, except this time n is now n minus 1 because you've moved one down. So you do this one, and then you pass down to the panel here, and then you pass across. And it looks a little bit nasty up there, but it's actually quite straight. I mean, you say, how do you implement that? And the DAG actually, the DAG actually looks like this. For a, this is a little a subsection of a, a much bigger. So you start off with the first diagonal, and then you do a panel, and the panel triggers the next bunch, and then there's the next one which come off it, and you've got these interconnections. And how do you write this in code? Um, when you're doing it with the matrices we're working with are actually distributed, so you've got node one, node two, node three, node four, and you have to actually remember that this tile is on this node, this tile is on that node, and this tile is on that node, and they're distributed block cyclic because it minimizes the total communication, ideally. Um, so you have to also throw in, factorize the first block, update the panel, which means broadcast down the panel here. And then you have to do the multiplication of the, the inverse here, and then broadcast across the row. And then you have to do another column broadcast because there's actually an extra term which comes down from that column, and then keep repeating and updating. So there's communication mixed in with the calculation. So in this particular slide, you'll see that some of the communication are in different colors. I don't remember which is which, actually, but it doesn't matter. This is just to show you that it's a nice, complicated DAG. So how do you, how do you actually write that using something like HPX? Well, you start off where you say, I've got a matrix, and for each tile, I'll just create a ready future. So you start off with every tile is ready. And then you say, for the first diagonal, the diagonal is always k, comma k. So you start from k equals 0 to n. And you say, for the first diagonal, when it's ready, do a Cholesky. This is TRF is the triangular factorization, effectively, which does the first Cholesky block. And I want to run it on my matrix. HP here is high priority. I'll show you that in a moment. So first tile, diagonal, execute this. Easy peasy. Now, when. I've used data flow here. Data flow is just when, then. So data flow. So when the diagonal is ready and the panel that I'm currently on, because when the diagonal is ready, you broadcast down the panel. So the first element that's in the panel below it, if the future for that panel from the previous iteration is already ready, which at the beginning it already is because you've created a ready matrix, effectively ready futures for a whole matrix. So when, when, the current, whoops, when the current panel is ready and the diagonal is ready, I can now do this. I can, um, I can do the, the, uh, the solve multiply, which is the inverse multiply operation. So I can multiply by the inverse. And so when the first panel is ready, sorry, I should say this panel future is equal to the old panel future plus a bunch of other stuff. And we're actually doing, it's a bit like doing x is equal to x plus 1. We're saying future for this panel is equal to the current future dot then. So what we're doing is an operation where you've got a matrix of futures, and you're saying this future is equal to the current future plus some other stuff, and now reassign the new future into that, that tile. So at each iteration, the future is kind of replaced. So you've got these tiles of futures, and they get replaced by the next one. So each iteration is effectively chaining onto the last iteration and replacing it, so that then the iteration after that picks the new one up. And then each time you go down the diagonal and you go along. And for a broadcast, you say, um, when, when this panel is ready from the previous, so that panel shared future is the one we just updated a moment ago. When that one is ready, and we've received the communication from the previous iteration that came in, now we can now update our panel with a, with a broadcast. We can send it out. And if we're not the one who owns that, we just sit and wait for a receiving block to come in. And so what you do is you end up writing these kind of, when this tile is ready, then operate this. And when that tile is ready, and the, the kind of the indexing of the futures and the fetching them, is, it's quite nasty and complicated. But what you end up with is that DAG that I showed you before. Now, when you run this, um, you, each one of these little green blocks here and the red blocks, 
These blue ones are the diagonal, um, the panel updates. There's actually a red one somewhere, which I, th I think it's actually at the beginning of here, and it's actually blue. In some of the other plots, it's red. So the first panel is a special, like, it's the highest priority panel. It has to go first. And all of the diagonals are super high priority tasks. They have to go first. Now, the first time we implemented this, we actually didn't get it quite right. And you can see that this chunk of stuff here is sitting there waiting for work. And that's actually because we had, we've actually got, this is 32 cores we're running on. It's two sockets. And our, in our scheduler, we were, we were not stealing work properly from the other Numa domains. So effectively, these ones here were saying, OK, we've done all our work, and we're just going to wait now until something comes in. And they weren't triggering the updates. So we had to do some cleaning up. And it's to do with inside the scheduler, we actually have multiple queues. And you can plug in your own schedulers and customize it. So you can do that kind of thing. And you can create an executor which only sends things to the high priority queue. So you would create a pool executor on the default queue, and you'd say thread priority high. And then any work that comes off this executor goes into that queue. You can create a normal priority one, which would go here. Uh, I've done arrows there, because you can, you, can, you can send stuff off, and you can have low priority ones. And we can have a pool executor. Now, one of the things that we, um, actually, I'll come to pools in a minute, but we, we created multiple thread pools to keep the communication separate from the, from the computation. So we had to fiddle about a bit with the priorities of the tasks in the DAG. And um, there's an interesting side note, which is not really connected. But there's, there's a problem with, with when, you, when you're creating this stuff, you say, well, I could create one pool, a thread pool, which is on NUMA domain 0, one socket, and a thread pool, which is on NUMA domain 1. And the scheduler here will do all the work here. And the scheduler here, and this will be nice, because then the memory Binding and everything will go clean, and we'll have separate Numa domains. But the problem is you can't steal tasks. Tasks are not stolen across thread pools. Tasks are stolen within thread pools. So you really want one thread pool which can handle two Numa domains. And the reason why that's important is because on this, on this graph here, if I had created one thread pool for this Numa domain and one thread pool for this Numa domain, now, when a task completes and it creates a continuation, which is the next task, by default, it always gives it to the same queue that it's on. Because then you're likely to get cache coherency. If a matrix tile has just finished and you say, do this multiply and now do an inverse or something, you want that to happen on the same core, ideally. So if you had two queues, one on this new domain, two pools, one on this new domain and one on this new domain, then what would happen is the first diagonal would complete, and then all of the children that would spawn off it would happen on the same pool. And, you end, and I did this. And you ended up effectively with a beautiful, nicely filled thing, but one socket was just empty because there was no stealing going on. And if you're going to have stealing between different thread pools, you might as well just make your scheduler on the one thread pool handle two Numa domains rather than having two Numa domains. And so it's, it's a side note. But it's one of those things which, when you're writing this kind of thing, you need to think about how are you going to coordinate this work? How are you going to make decisions about where work goes? And um, so one pool or two pools, you can choose. But there are trade-offs. And so I mentioned thread pools here. We have, we have an interface to. To, we have a topology class which wraps up the HW lock library. And there's actually a proposal. I think I've got a slide in a minute. HW lock is, uh, is a, if people are familiar with it, it's hardware locality. And it's a really nice library that comes from the MPI people to tell you how many sockets have I got, what are the cache sizes, how many GPUs are there, where are the PCI buses, all that kind of stuff. And at startup, what we do is we bind all our cores using HW lock. And we can use HW lock to tell us where the cores are. And we can use it to iterate over. We have, a, um, we have a resource partitioner, which kind of wraps the topology. And so at startup, if I want to create an MPI pool, and I say four threads, four cores in my MPI pool, I can, I can iterate over Numa domains. And within those Numa domains, I can iterate over cores and PUs, processing units. And I can say, add to this pool that core. So I can effectively say, mm, I want four cores on that pool and eight cores on that pool. And I can iterate over the cores and say, go in that pool, go in that pool. And I can do that at startup. And it's a very nice interface. And this is not standardized, and it needs to be. So I have a slide on that in a minute. Um, how you actually do, do that kind of thing. Why do we want an MPI pool? Because the MPI communication is absolutely crucial. Those messages have to go out with the zero latency. And when they're received, they have to come in with zero latency. Because when you're on the node and you need to do your panel update or your column update, whatever, and you're waiting for a tile block from the other, from the other node, you don't want to be working on the previous iteration solving all these things. Because when that message does come in and that tile goes into the queue, 
then some of the other stuff might already be waiting for it. You need it to be absolutely high priority in the queue. So we actually created a separate thread pool to put all the MPI stuff on. And MPI actually has its own threading mechanisms as well, so that makes things a lot simpler. And, and, and the results speak for themselves in, in a little while. But you, you might want thread pools for managing things like QT GUIs. Because, I mean, it's not just HPC people that are using HPC. It's you guys, you guys and most of you are not doing HPC, I guess. So you might have sensor data coming in. You've got, I mean, the C++ community is bigger than the HPX community or the HPC community. So having thread pools for all this stuff is really uh, very, very useful. Um, so after we cleaned up the task stealing, things look much better now. We've got basically pretty good utilization of the cores. Nothing's waiting for anything. There's very short waits. Whoops, I beg your pardon. Um, there's very short waits going on here when effectively the, ne you know, the next high priority task, I, I, you should be able to see which one triggers it, but I, I, the color coding, it might be, the color coding's not so good on that one. But you can see the gaps. I mean, this is microseconds of, you know, a microsecond or less of waiting. You've basically got 99.9% .9 usage. There's a problem though, which if you look carefully at this, you'll actually see that these red ones here are bigger than these red ones here. And I didn't notice this, it took me ages to see, it wasn't me that spotted it even. But these red ones here, these are the same tasks, these are the gems that are going on at one point, and these are the same ones, these ones on Numa Domain 0 are happening much quicker than these ones on Numa Domain 1. And Raffaele produced this plot, which was the timing. This is very interesting, isn't it? Well, it turns out that when we allocate, it's a benchmark we're doing, we allocate the memory at the start, we fill it with numbers, and then we set Cholesky going on it. That allocation was happening on the first thread that we initialize, and so the memory is being touched by the first core that's touching it. So all the memory in the operating system is being effectively bound to one um, memory controller on one NUMA domain. So when we do tasks on the other NUMA domain, we're getting cross NUMA traffic, and we're seeing stuff that's happening on this NUMA domain is slow, Stuff that's happening on this, uh, sorry, the other way around. Stuff that's happening on this one is fast time is on this axis, a big pun. So this numa domain naught, the tasks are actually doing quite, this is like the theoretical peak performance of the machine here is about eight milliseconds for that one. And some of them are taking 20 odd milliseconds because they're fetching everything from the other numa domain and, you know, and threads are being suspended by the operating system, all that stuff, which is why you get the, why you get the peaks and the spread anyway. So the obvious solution is, at startup, we'll use an interleaved memory policy so that we get things spread across both NUMA domains nicely, and that will even out the, even out the, um, even out the access time. But, uh, and, and when we implemented this, things got much better. We got an instrument, instant like 35, 40% speed up in some of the cases just by, just by making the memory access. And, and this really drives home how important it is to, to know which which resources you're running on and which ones you're using. But we wanted to find out if we could do better. And the question is, instead of just having an interleaved uh, memory, what about if we actually interleaved it in such a way that each tile was bound to one, because this is one page, which is 4,096 bytes. Now, if your tiles are 256 by 256 doubles, it's like 8K or something. So it actually doesn't fit in one page and I can't remember, I think it's anything that's bigger than n is bigger than 32 for double precision, doesn't fit in a page anymore. So maybe we could bind pages manually in patterns like this so that this tile of the matrix is on that NUMA domain and this one's on this one and we could actually chunk it up. See if then we could get slightly better performance. So it turns out that when you use a mem policy bind, this one here, the operating system actually allocates tables. It has these memory lookup tables to say which domain your memory is on. And it turns out the operating system, once you get more than about 10,000 of these, it starts sort of falling over. And so we couldn't use that. So what we actually ended up doing is having a first touch allocator. So you allocate the memory, and then we can give it effectively a, a pattern that we want it to bind. And it launches tasks and touches them specifically with threads bound to these cores. And that's another reason why you might want to create memory pools at startup. You might want a memory pool a memory pool, uh, sorry, a thread pool that is bound to this core, which you just use for touching memory on that numa domain, and a thread pool which is bound to that core, which you just use for touching memory on that. And ideally, you'd like those thread pools to just go to sleep when you're not using them so they don't interrupt anybody and only wake up when you give them. That's something which at some point we'll implement. Um, so if we were to do this clever memory touching policy, could we somehow then tell the scheduler that when a tile, which is in this circle here, comes in to put it on numa domain one, 
even if we don't know at compile time. So if we know at compile time where, I mean, and in fact with the Cholesky, because it's a logical pattern, you can actually do it at compile time. And that's what the Parsec guys do. They know up front that these tiles fit this pattern and they schedule it kind of in advance so that the scheduler actually knows before it's run where each tile is going to go and they do very well. Can we do it dynamically so that you could give me memory which I don't know where it is at compile, I've got no idea. Could I, could I, could I improve things? So what I wanted was an executor which is somehow dynamic. Now the thing about executors is you create an executor, it's a CUDA executor, or it's a CPU executor, or it's a NUMA domain NOR executor, or it's a NUMA, and every task that goes on that executor is gonna go where you, this is done at compile time. Executors are kind of fixed. And what I really wanted was a, an executor which was dynamic and it delayed the placement of the tasks until the tasks are ready. Now we actually have something in HPX which does half of that for us. Our data flow, our data flow operator, it actually, holds on to things until the futures are ready, and then schedules it for execution. So I created an executor, which I've called a guided pool executor, which effectively, when it creates the continuation, it now has the ready futures. So you say, op multiply this matrix tile by this matrix pile, this matrix tile. When those two come in, they're already ready. I can extract from the futures the actual values because they're ready, call a hint function, and this allows you to effectively say, well, I've got a, a generic hint type, and I template it over my matrices M, and I'm going to return the NUMA domain that those matrices are bound to, and I'm then going to create an executor which is templated on my hint type, and because the continuation, when you say dot then, you always, you always know what the types are because they're kind of implicit in the dot then, they're the result of the futures that came through, so you can actually get away with this. The, 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 the template stuff, when you expand all this, is quite nasty, but it works, and it allows you to effectively do a late binding, and so if I have just a single matrix coming in, so my hint looks like this, there's my Cholesky, tag to, 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 to dis discriminate it. I have a NUMA hint, and it returns matrix get NUMA. So my matrix type has actually got a little, I know when I bound the memory, at, at the, when I initialized it, where I put it. So I can say, get me the NUMA for this tile. And if I have two, and I'm multiplying this one by this one, it turns out I'm always storing the result in matrix two. So I want to put this one, if I can, on the domain that NUMA, that matrix two is in, because I know I'm writing to that one, and I'm reading from the other one, and I'm reading writing from that one. So put it in that one. And if I have a three matrix operator, I, in, in this case, you can actually do if one or that one, then do this. But I kept it simple. You could, I just put, gave, give, put it in three. So, and you can have any number of overloads for the operator depending on what your continuations look like. So you've got this, this, and you can just keep overloading. So it's extensible. And um, the, the, the executor is really a prototype for, I've got a custom scheduler. And my custom scheduler knows how to put things on Numenum and knows how to do affinity. How does the user interact with that custom scheduler if they have to go through an executor? So it's really a kind of prototype which at the moment it's, it's kind of experimental, but I can see a way where this could actually become something much more general purpose. Okay, we're down to the last 15 minutes. Um, a little note is that when you have something like a Cholesky and you go iterator, generate a bunch of futures and then attach continuations to them, and when those ones continuations come through, then attach the next, if you just run that loop, it'll generate hundreds of millions of futures because everything is asynchronous. It just execute, async, execute, async, execute, and you just keep getting futures back, and you end up with this DAG, which in theory could fill the entire memory of your machine if it was big enough. So you need a way of saying, stop, just unroll three iterations, and then when the first one's completed, unroll the fourth, please, and when the second one's completed, unroll the fifth, and so we have a, a sliding semaphore, which we kind of invented just to solve this problem. And what you can do is you can effectively say, um, allow me to have n iterations in flight, say five. Give me five iterations in flight. Now, when, when, when the nth iteration, when the second iteration finishes, in one of the tasks that you as the programmer, when you generated this algorithm, you said, well, whenever this panel update finishes, it basically means that this column is done and I can move on to the next one. So just add an extra signal to your semaphore which says I, the ith iteration is finished. 
And now the sliding semaphore will basically increment itself and say, okay, I'm allowed to go on one further. And you stick a weight. Uh, that should actually be inside one of the, uh, the I, I've dropped, it didn't fit on the slide. So there's another loop around here. There's the I loop. And this semaphore weight on I is inside an I loop. So what you're doing is you're looping and you're saying, when three iterations are generated, wait. And this is another way of allowing effectively kind of the scheduler and the user to interact. And this is, this is, this is a little bit clunky. And there's another problem, which is that the Cholesky is a diagonal. And the first iteration is quite big. The second is a bit smaller. The third is a bit smaller. So as you get further and further on, you actually want to increase n. So that at the beginning, you want three iterations in flight. But at the end, you want like 10 to keep the queues full. So it's a kludgy way. This is just another way of me saying that the proposals we've got for executors, they, they don't go far enough in terms of allowing us these kind of controls. Another thing we had to invent was that we, we, we came up with a little thing called a split future, where you have a shared matrix, shared future with a matrix in it, and it spawns two tasks. One of the tasks actually wants to write to the matrix, but the matrix is a const ref because it's a shared future, and you can only, you can only, you can only pass the const ref through because both ones get it. And this, this task actually doesn't do anything to the matrix. It just needs to know that I can't run until that one's finished. So we came up with a split future, which basically allows you to change your function to return a pair of a matrix and a bool, for example. And then you can do a split future of a pair of a thing, a bool, and get two futures out of it. And then you can attach your continuation separately to the two futures that you get. So you've effectively got a, a fork where you've split the futures into two separate ones. One of them can take the matrix. One of them can just use for you know, just saying go. So we clean up the scheduler, we do nice MPI pools, custom allocators, specialized executors, and we get results which look like this. And so I mentioned that there's this library called Parsec, where they, what they do is they know in advance the exact shape of the DAG, and they kind of design everything up front. So at compile time, you actually know where everything's going. So they are what we consider to be the gold standard, and they're green. So when we run this on quite big matrices, so this is a 40,000... 40,000 by 40,000 matrix, and we're running it up to 64 nodes. You can see green is, H, green is parsec and red is HPX. And basically, we're, we're matching them on these two graphs pretty well. We're, we're dropping a little, uh, sorry, parsec is green, so parsec is dropping off on large node counts. And this is actually because our MPI thread pool is allowing us to get slightly better. So the red one here, we're beating them, and the red one here, we're beating them. Not by much, but I mean, this is still 20, 30%. Um, so on the big matrices, we're actually doing as, you know, as good as the best in the world, effectively, currently. And these blue ones are the current matrix libraries installed on the Cray. So these are the kind of industry ones which are already out there. So we're basically twice as good as them and as good as the rest of the world. On the medium-sized tiles, uh, medium size, th sorry, this is 512 block size, 256 block. This is how big the tiles are in our matrices. But it's all, it, it's a big matrix in each but it was varying the block size. So on the medium block sizes, we're almost as good as Parsec, but we're losing a bit. And I think that's because we have some overheads in our scheduler, which are just, we're losing a little bit. And possibly some of our, some of our cache coherent kind of assignment of blocks to cores, we might be actually putting them on the wrong ones. And we need to go through and clean that up. And that's something we're doing at the moment. On the very small tiles, everybody does badly. But we, uh, we, we're as good as the existing libraries, but we're a little bit behind Parsec. So, so what this is telling us is that the basic idea, as long as, the, as long as the chunks of work are quite big, it's excellent. We can compete with the best. On the smaller work chunks, we need a little bit, we've, we've still got some cleaning up to do. So there's still a job for me. And, um, and so when you run the whole thing, it actually looks something like that. And you think, that's awesome. We've basically used the machine. It's fantastic. Now, it's interesting, this bit at the end, because when you get to that final diagonal, you, you have to wait. I mean, there just isn't enough work to keep the queues full. So, what you really want to do is do something else. Now, I spent 10 years working in visualization, and all the simulations that are running on our machines, they generate all this data, they dump it out to disk, and then later on, they run the viz. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have a common thread pool so the viz code was running, and the simulation code was running, and the IO code, and all, this, and all of these things that you might do are all running on the thread pools. And then when that work queue is starting to drain, you can just do other stuff. And, um, and there's tons of things you can be doing. So what we want to do is create like algebra libraries that the scientists can use for their matrix stuff. But we also want to create, I mean, if they're using HPX for their simulation as well, and they're using it for their visualization, and they're using it, if they use the same library for everything, then all of this will just fall out, and you'll get it all for free. So there's tons of things you can do. How are we doing time-wise? Almost out of time. I should probably just, um, 
I should probably just shut up and let you ask questions because we've only got five minutes left, yeah? Um, things like mixing OpenMP and HPX. At the moment, shutting down the HPX runtime so that it open because OpenMP binds its threads to the cores at the same time we do. You can't have both of them really running at the same time. So things like shutting down the runtime so another library can Because if we're going to make a linear algebra library and give it to scientists and say, use it, but they're using OpenMP in their code, we have to, we have to cross this, this bridge of interoperability. So we're working on ways of like temporarily suspending the runtime. Um, all the work in progress is things that, things that I've mentioned before. We need to work on executors affinity, all this kind of stuff. Um, and the, the, the one thing which is slowing us down, what's wrong, what's the one thing that's wrong with HPX? It's that in our schedulers, we do quite a lot. Our schedulers create tasks. So if you do a parallel loop, you do a parallel four, we actually create a bunch of tasks, we assign them to the cores, they go into the queues, they get taken off, it goes through there. And the overhead, if your parallel for loop is actually just doing a tiny little lambda, if it's only like a few microseconds of work inside the lambda, it just isn't worth creating tasks. Now, OpenMP does it, OpenMP does it slightly differently. They have basically one thread, and then when you get to the fork point, those other threads are kind of sitting there ready, and it just gives a function pointer to them, and they execute, and then they quit. So, oh, I don't know what happened then. Anyway, so OpenMP has a much light, lighter weight task scheduling for that kind of thing. Now, we need to introduce a mode where we can do basically the same thing in HPX, and then everything will be fine. We did a comparison, Cocos, which is another library. You can see for big work, no difference. Medium work, no difference. When you get down to the small work here, you can see the, the two HPX ones, the green and the purple. When the, when, the, when the grain size of individual little tiny tasks is very, very small, then we have significant overhead. So this is our main task at the moment, is cleaning that up. There's actually a proposal for task blocks, which I've never, ever used. So you can say task block, do some work, end task block. It's basically a C++ fork join block. Possibly we could reuse this mechanism to say within this block, switch the way our scheduler operates to doing something differently. We're looking at lots of different ways of doing this kind of things. And um, topology I was mentioning, this is what your, your HW lock produces. Um, I'm going to stop talking now and... Um, and let you just ask questions because I'm, I'm at the end of my time. And I'm basically at the end of the slides. We ran, we ran an astrophysics code up to 650,000 cores on 10,000 nodes of the machine. And we get, this is a slightly cheaty graph because you can't do these big ones on small node counts. And so as we increase the number of nodes, we're actually increasing the problem size. So it's a combination of weak scaling and strong scaling. But we actually get pretty good performance even on, I mean, that's over half a million cores running on one code. And this is using the distributed HPX. So we're trying to give you a nice, easy to use API, but still give you the ability to get right down to the metal and do high performance code. And that's basically the, um, the, the upshot of it. When I first started using HPX, I said to Hartman, it's the best library I've ever used that doesn't work. And I can say now that after about three years or four years of working on it, it's now, it's pretty awesome. I mean, anyway, it's the best library I've ever used that's not bad at all. So. Uh, I encourage you all to try it. And as the last thing, I say, it's open source. There's a fairly small number of us working on it. If you guys start using it and playing with it and you know, finding problems and fixing them, then it would be great. And um, there's even jobs at CSCS for people doing this kind of thing. So I'll mention that as well. So that's the end of the talk. Questions? Five minutes. I'm starting to lose my voice now. So I sh it's a good job we finished. No questions. I can talk more. Oh, yes, question. Uh, you actually already answered to the first question, the question I wanted to ask about how the runtime uh, coexists with OpenMP, for example. Yeah. Already, it's, let's say, limited technology. So you just said that you have to just switch off the runtime and let open, OpenMP do its job and then go back to the, to the runtime. But uh, I have the same question for the distributed environment. How does the uh, AES right, play with So when, for the stuff we've been doing, the question for people listening is how do we interact with things like MPI if we're doing distributed computing? What we do is we, we compile HPX with all the networking turned off for this particular stuff. So MPI just works like it would on any other bit of code. Because in this particular Cholesky, the MPI is already implemented. So it does the communication. Now, if you 
We actually, you, we've got multiple different ways of implementing our parcel port. One of them is an MPI-based one. And if you enable the MPI parcel port and you've got MPI in your code, it works, but you need to be very careful because if somebody does a collective operation in a task, and on this node, that task is active, but on that node, that task is suspended, then you have to be a little bit careful about handling deadlocks because what can happen is you can have n nodes are all waiting and one node is busy doing something else and if for some reason, I mean you can easily create conditions where you get deadlocks where this guy's sending somebody something and this one's sending something and, and once it gets more than three nodes it's like oh my god I can't cope. Things are waiting for things that are being sent around and, and it happens. So it works but you need to be very careful and um, yeah. So. That's basically it. But for things like OpenMP, there's multiple options. You see, if we had a thread pool, which was doing all the HPX stuff, and then we just said to it, keep going, but when your queues are empty, go to sleep, and then we kicked off OpenMP, the operating system will handle the fact that I've bound eight cores, eight threads to these cores, and the, they've bound eight threads to these cores. It'll just give us less time slices, and you'll get cache thrashing and that kind of thing because you're doing different stuff. So we, could either, we can either wait for our queues to drain and be empty and then imp impose a kind of fork join point here and then kick in OpenMP. We could leave our stuff running and then have OpenMP run at the same time and try to stop anybody adding new work to this one. Um, the other thing, well, what we really would like to do is we've actually got a prototype where you can basically replace the OpenMP library with an HPX version of it. So the OpenMP actually runs on the HPX threads. Going back to what I said before, because we still have the scheduler with higher overheads, you lose performance then. So what we really want to do at the moment is have some way of basically telling the HPX scheduler that there's some OpenMP-like tasks coming in. They just go into a special queue of their own, which they always you know, don't do anything while there's work in this queue. And then maybe we can match the performance of OpenMP by, by essentially you know, stripping out all the extra work and and then the problem will go away because we'll be able to just intermix OpenMP and HPX together. That's work in progress. So invite me back next year and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll have that one nailed. <coughs> uh, I saw you first, so. So I think if you, if you enable GPU usage in HPX, then you also have to enable minimum of C++14 probably, and possibly even beyond that. And the GPU support is limited to really parallel for loops. You can't create DAGs. Like, you know, we can't have all these continuations and stuff running on the GPU. Now, a side note on that is the Cocos library has a way of doing something similar to that, where they can create continuations and things. And we're looking at ways that we might integrate that. But the GPU support is really, at the moment, I would say it works quite nicely if you've written CUDA kernels and you just want to run them and get a future back. And that's great because then you've got all your existing CUDA stuff. If you want to rewrite your CUDA stuff using HPX Parallel 4 and those kind of things, that's a lot more work and it's a bit too experimental for me to say go out and do it. I mean, if you want to play with it, do, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't make someone use it for production stuff just yet. But that's, uh, that's really where we're heading. I mean, the heterogeneous computing is a big part of the, you know, the, the future. I mean, we have, to, we have 5,000 GPUs. We really need to use those nicely and get them integrated with this. So it's on our mind. It's already like the, 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 con the change of continuations to maybe have the executor creating rather than the future creating the work. Things like that, are, uh, they're sort of micro-optimizations, I suppose. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, the stuff we've got is actually working quite well at the moment. I, I mean, if everybody just threw away all the old compilers, you know, <laughs> that, that would be a good start because then we wouldn't have to maintain all this old stuff. But uh, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything, but maybe during coffee I'll... Uh, and what, what do you think about coroutines? Oh, cor yeah, I didn't mention... Actually, coroutines, coroutines awesome. 
Now, there's quite a lot of what we do, you can actually do with coroutines and do it in a much, more, uh, much, much cheaper way because you don't have to worry about creating all these futures, shared states, and that kind of thing, and the synchronization because the compiler is unrolling some of this stuff for you. But because the way we create the DAGs is quite dynamic, I, I think it's a bit like if you had a, if you have an executor, I think there are some, some proposals for things like inline executors, which I, I forget the details now. But if you, if you had continuations which were unrolled by the compiler effectively and instantiated right there and then, that could basically be replaced by coroutines. But some of the stuff where we are jumping from different parts of the code and suspending, because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how we would put suspension. I need to think about this a bit, actually. I, I, I've thought about this in the past and then forgotten what I decided. <laughs> but you know, when, when you suspend and you're effectively doing a yield and then you're pulling in other work, and the way we kind of, coroutines off, yeah, to, to the short answer to your question is coroutines potentially offer us some really interesting ways of implementing some of this stuff with very low overheads. But at the moment, I, I, I really need to think carefully before I try and answer because it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's potentially a huge change, actually, the coroutines. And, and in fact, the way, I mentioned that Cocos has a way of doing DAGs on the GPU. And the way they implement it is actually very similar to a coroutine, because what they do, you can't suspend a task and then resume it later, which we can do on the CPU, but you can't do on the GPU. Because, uh, so, so what they do is, that the, when, a, when a task needs to get something which isn't ready, they basically end the task, they save the state, and then they resubmit themselves back into the queue with a flag that says, when I'm resubmitted, jump back to this point with the new result that comes in. That's sort of like what a coroutine is doing. It's yielding back and then re-entering at a no new point. So yes, I mean, coroutines potentially give us some really interesting ideas, but they're still ideas at this stage. So. Who's in charge? Should we stop? I vote we go for tea because it's 11.20 now. And I'm losing my voice. <laughs>